Hello and welcome into the Cubs on Deck podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Greg Huss and today I am joined by Myrtle Beach Pelicans broadcaster Sam Wiederhaft. Sam, thanks for coming back on the show. How are things going, dude? Everything's good, Greg. Uh, always a pleasure to come on. Um, we actually have games and some sub- some substance to talk about now with uh, a lot of guys that we didn't really know a lot about beforehand. So uh, super excited to dive into it with you. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to hit on quite a few guys. At the, by the back end of this episode, we're just going to be kind of running through some dudes on the Myrtle Beach roster. Uh, we did this last year. We did this last year with you where we had you on and just wanted to get to know some dudes, basically, because we talked about it when we did the, the season preview. That there's so many new faces, guys that we aren't as familiar with, making their way up to the, to the first full season affiliate, which is you guys at Myrtle Beach. And so it, it, it's tough. Like these are these are brand new guys. We're getting to see them on MILB for the uh, TV for the first time. You're getting to see them in action on the field for the first time. So uh, this worked out well last time where we're just kind of introducing some guys. I know people have got had the chance to watch them on on MILB TV or in the ballpark. But a lot of people don't know what these guys are about or how they've been performing necessarily. So by the end, like I said, we're going to be getting into I have eight ish dudes or so that are just kind of new they're new to the to the organization they're new to our radars and we'll get into, into those guys at the end uh we'll also cover a few returner returners to Myrtle Beach guys that we're more familiar with but right off the off the bat here we got to talk about Cade Horton I know he's not he's not in Myrtle Beach now obviously yeah. but he made his his uh, AAA debut I know we got you on the show here now but it's it, we got to talk about Cade Horton because you could argue that Cade is is the top prospect in the Cubs organization. I know PCA is there. PCA is the number one prospect, but like what Cade Horton is doing is unbelievable. So Cade in his debut, I believe that was on Saturday in Des Moines uh, for the Iowa Cubs. He threw four innings. He gave up two hits and four walks. That was good for two earned runs and six strikeouts. Uh, more importantly, in my eyes, he threw 77 pitches, which I know when Cade was in Myrtle Beach with you guys last year uh, and working his way up to South Bend and, and Tennessee, he was not throwing 77 pitches for you guys, that's for sure. Uh, no, that's uh, the unfortunate thing about these lower levels is typically those those pitchers are on really strict inning, inning limits. I mean, I think about Jackson Ferris last year and, um, you know, he barely got to throw four innings. So it's, uh, you know, it's it, you only get a small sample size with the pitchers at this level, but um, yeah, Cade started four games for us back in 2023 at the beginning of the season. And uh, I mean, Greg, you talk about, you know, our level getting new players and kind of getting to introduce them to the fan base and, um, you know, people get their eyes on them for the first time. And, you know, before all this Horton hysteria, which is what I like to call it when he was in Merle Beach, but um, before he really started to succeed in minor league baseball, like that first round pick was a little criticized by the fans because, yeah, he did really well in the College World Series, but before that, didn't really have a ton of pitching experience. Um, so it was kind of seemed like the Cubs were taking a chance on him. And then he comes to Myrtle Beach and absolutely shoves and goes to South Bend and then ends the year in Tennessee and wins a championship. So uh, he has just been splendid so far. He's been really fun to watch. He's just been tearing up the system, and I, I expect nothing less than that during his time in Iowa, really. It, it was good. I mean – him walking four guys was kind of out of the ordinary. I, I kind of profile, I, I I tweeted out as he was making a start. I think he had walked two guys. It was either two or three guys the entire year in his few starts, in his three-ish starts uh, and in Tennessee this year. And then he got called up to Iowa. He did walk four guys. He had a really rough, I believe it was second inning of work where he struggled uh, with command. He walked a few guys. He had a wild pitch, didn't look as good. But really, it was all you can ask for for a guy making his AAA debut. He's just a call away from the major leagues, and it, it was it was really fun to see what Kate Horton did. He was sitting ninety one to ninety four with the fastball. the The slider was was looking pretty good. I know the the, the spin rate on that was up, to, I think twenty six hundred RPMs, which is kind of what you want to see from him. He was throwing the change up a little bit too, and I, I don't know. It's just to me, all these are just tune ups for what when we see him in Chicago, which is, dude, it's it's crazy, man. It, it's crazy that he can go from Myrtle Beach, where he he was probably, I mean, he wasn't probably, he was definitely 
way better than anybody that he was facing during his time in Myrtle Beach, that's for sure. But it's crazy to see a guy going from Myrtle Beach last year at the lowest full season affiliate all the way up to Chicago this year. Like That's going to happen. And that doesn't really happen with, with pitchers ever. No, it, it's special guys that, that make that happen. And we knew that Cade, you know, his first you – know, he was only – in Myrtle Beach for one home start. So I got to call one of his games and you could tell like from his first inning, uh, just the way that he conducted himself on the mound and was able to work through it. Um, you know, the stuff on his, on his slider. Um, I remember our video coordinator, Britton Barthold, who had all the, uh, the Hawkeye and TrackMan data up on his laptop. That first inning, he texts me, he goes, he's throwing 98 right now. I'm like, Oh boy, we better strap in here, boys. Um, and he's just continued that. And, you know, we're, we're still only like one full month into the season. So, um, by the time that he fully settles in and gets into the stretch, he's going to be really fun to watch. And no, I can't wait till he gets in Chicago, man. It's going to be a fun ride. Yeah, that is going to be fun. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's only a few more starts before we see that in Chicago. Can't waste too many bullets in the minor leagues with an arm like that. So the only other non Pelicans note that I had here for this episode, before we dig into, into your roster is. Baseball America dropped their most recent, their update to their prospect, their top 100 prospect rankings. And uh, it had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Cubs. Sorry, I had to count that up because the, the Cubs are loaded in terms of the It's top good that you have to list. count it, dude. Exactly. I mean, there was, there was one day when I, I was like, oh, there's one guy there. So the fact that I can say there's seven dudes yeah. is pretty impressive. So they <laughs> did have an update. Uh, I'll run through these names. I want to hit on on mainly just one guy here because he stands out, but Pete Crow Armstrong is ranked 20th in all of baseball. Kate Horton is ranked 22nd. Those are two guys that we've grown accustomed to seeing at those spots in top 100 list. Matt Shaw is ranked 28th. We've also seen him as high as that. That might be one of the highest we've seen him, but he's, in, he's been top 50 kind of across the board. Owen Casey breaks the top 50. He's at number 40. That's something we've grown accustomed to as well. Jefferson Rojas cracks the top 50 as well here. He's at number 47. Kevin Alcantara is down at number 91 and Moises Ballesteros also breaks the top 100 list at number 93. So the one that stands out to me the most there is Jefferson Rojas at number 47. I think that he is, pro that is probably the highest that we've seen him on any like national publications in terms of top 100 lists. I, I've been really high on Jefferson Rojas. If you listen to this podcast in the past, like Jefferson Rojas is our guy. Brian was quick to point him out uh, in last spring training before he even made it up to Myrtle beach with you. But what do you what do you what do you like the most about Jefferson Rojas when you saw him down in Myrtle a year ago? Uh, everything. I mean, he was he was such an electric player to watch, and I mean, he just turned nineteen, I think, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um. So so much youth, but uh, his demeanor on the field, I think, was what really shocked me for being so young. And he never, you know, he's one of those those demeanor guys where he never got too high and never got too low. And uh, his glove was excellent over it short. His bat was his, like his hands were so calm. Uh, the swing was so fluid. And he was just so much more mature than probably what a player his age should be playing like. And, you know, we always talk about, um, you know, guys like him who are facing pitchers that are a lot older than him. And that that never phased him. I mean, he was always he never looked over challenged um, in an at bat. He was always really tuned in, really locked in and, uh, you know, really just disciplined at the plate. And, you know, the fact that he breaks onto the scene now at 47 in the Baseball America Top 100, I think, is uh, absolutely justified with the way that he's been playing. And, um, yeah, I mean, just completely bursted on the scene last year. I don't think he was ranked anywhere really going into last year and then had the season he did with us. And, you know, now he's tearing it up in South Bend. Yeah, Jefferson Rojas uh, coming into this season was ranked as the, uh, according to Baseball America, as the tenth best prospect in the Cubs organization, and now we see him as I guess still only one, only fifth, but it is fifth and forty seventh in all of baseball. That's a big jump. That's that's pretty impressive. Uh, you like to see him up up in that, and that, that's getting close to that elite status. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think it's a matter of time before uh, our boy Pedro Ramirez comes knocking on the door because the week he had with South Bend last week, he was just named Midwest League Player of the Week. And, uh, man, I am such a fan of the way that guy plays. He was uh, second base for us last year mainly with Rojas at short, a switch hitter with such a good swing from both sides. And, uh, you know, hope that he gets his moment as well. Dude, Pedro went – I think he went 0 for 5 on Sunday – and he still won player of the other week. That's how much he killed the ball in the week leading up to that over five, right? He, I mean, yeah. he is hitting close to 500 
over his last like 60 plate appearances, which is outrageous. Pedro's yeah. been Pedro has been terrific. That I mean that infield between with, with Pedro uh, and Rojas has been fun in in South Bend, that's for sure. And that's you got a front row seat to it last year and a front row seat to, to Pedro coming back last year when he returned from the Arizona Complex League after being sent back down there. When he returned, he went on a hot streak to end that year and he just kind of carried that over to this year. It's been been incredible. Yeah, you know, I think that reminds you that, um, you know, we're doing this podcast in early May, but I think Pedro got sent down about this time last year, about a month into the season, and uh, he was there for a few weeks and then came back and uh, really turned his turned his season around, and we saw power from him that we hadn't seen before. And, uh, you know, this past off season he got a lot stronger. You can tell he's put on some more weight, um, you know, to help, help, the, help the power and help the drive numbers, but uh, yeah, he is one of my favorite stories from my four years of doing this is watching Pedro come back and uh, just take the league by storm. Yeah. Uh, the last guy I want to talk about here with this top 100 is I want to hit on Moises Ballesteros a little bit because him at number, number 93 is warranted considering how much he is tearing up the double A Southern League right now. He is this season, as of right now, we're recording this on, on Monday night. He is batting in 79 plate appearances plate appearances he's batting 353 with a on-base percentage of 443 and a slugging of 559 that's a 201 wrc plus striking out not even 14 percent of his at bats walking almost 13 percent of his at bats he's he's a 20 year old catcher in double a i mean did you see this coming when he was with you in myrtle well, I think that was the concern was that, you know, okay, he's doing well at the single A level, but can he, when the pitching gets better, can that eye still, you know, stay where it's at? Can he stay this disciplined? And, uh, you know, to be able to continue to be patient and doing what he's doing right now, I think is really encouraging. Um, you could see it with the swing and the power that uh, that was going to translate to higher levels, but it was just a question of, is he going to keep this discipline up? And it appears that he is. And, um, yeah, absolutely. To be a top 100 prospect guy is right where Moises deserves to be, and uh, he's he's a really fun player to watch, that's for sure. Since since Fangraphs started collecting WRC Plus minor league leaderboard numbers in 2006, so they, they started doing this in 2006, there's been only three guys that have been 20 years or younger, like Moises Ballesteros is, uh, log 70 play, 79 plate appearances or more like Moises Ballesteros has and post a WRC plus of 201 or better like Moises Ballesteros. Only three guys since 2006 have done that in the double A level, right? Those three guys are Carlos Correa, Giancarlo Stanton, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. That's pretty good company to be. I know it, it, it's it's a weird combination of stats there. But that's a really good company to be in in a, in a small sample size, obviously. I was going to ask you, how did you find that stat? Uh, you just go to minor, the minor league fan graphs, like leaderboards, and you can go in like sort it, like you can throw in criteria, right? And so like I, I went in, I, I saw that, that Moises had 79 plate appearances. So I was like, I wonder, because there, there's plenty of guys that have posted WRC pluses and uh, higher than that in like, what, 10 plate appearances. But you got to go and sort by based on his criteria. And then when you do that, you can you can see who pops up. So yeah, those three guys, I and mean, that's, that's that's pretty damn good. And even the guys yeah. that are like just below him, I, I I don't have it pulled up, but like uh, Starlin Castro was there, Joe Adele was there, Jason Hayward was there. Uh, There's a couple other guys. And, like those are still like real. That's a really good company to be in. Not quite yeah. as Correa, Vlad, and Stanton, but still impressive. Oh yeah, and he's the only catcher out of those uh, four, I guess. So exactly. he, you know he adds that those qualities to his game as well. So um, yeah, he's just uh, he's a really special player. He's got a great head on his shoulders as well. Um, really confident, uh, determined player and, um, you know, could make a really big impact in Chicago sometime soon. For sure. Let's get into some Pelicans talk. And I want to lead it off with what Andy Gariola did this past week. On Tuesday night, Andy Gar Gariola had two home runs in, in that game on Tuesday night. One was hit 459 feet. It was hit over the scoreboard where they were playing. They weren't, they weren't in Myrtle. They're on the road. It was hit over the scoreboard. Andy Gariola has some light tower power. It's incredible. Like overall, his numbers across the course of the season have not been tremendous. I mean, he's he's still got a, a WRC plus at 98, but the power is like making that that WRC plus like fly up where it is right now, you know? 
Yeah, he's, he's really the definition of that power first kind of player. Um, the fact that, you know, you look at his average and it's it's low 200s right now, but he's hit five home runs so far. He's driven in 25. Um, those are the top two in the league as far as those numbers uh, so far. But um, yeah, just a ton of power in that swing. There's a lot of aggression when he gets to the plate. And uh, I, I say it on the broadcast all the time, but if there's a breaking ball that lands anywhere near the middle of the zone, he's yeah. taking that to left field every yeah. single time. Um, and that's what he did against Salem. Now, I will say I was listening to the Salem broadcast, and they said 465. Okay. And uh, I was told 459. So I don't know which one the official number is, but still, incredible power from Andy. And uh, to hit it over to the scoreboard is is absolutely incredible. So he is, uh, yeah, he, he's that typical three four hitter that just mashes. I I've said in the past that I think that Yo Hendrick Pinyango has the most like aggressive swing. Like when he makes contact and hits a home run, you're like, oh my god! Like that it just like it looks different. It doesn't necessarily sound different or like go any further. It just, you watch the the swing and you're like, he like pulverized that baseball. Like based on like his his demeanor, his the how fast he brings the bat through the zone, stuff like that. And Gariola is up there with with Pinyango in terms of like, oh he he did it to that baseball. No, hundred um, percent. He is one of the the few players that you know when he really connects on one. I could I could see it's a home run right away. Yeah, um, so I can yeah. get ready. For, I can get ready for my home run call right away. But um, you know, I guess to put things in perspective, last year he led the team with sixty runs batted in. Already this year, a month into it, he's at twenty five. Um, so the production is just really increased from him. You look at the average, and it's not great. Um, he's still striking out quite a bit, mm-hmm. but he's doing more damage. And, uh, you know, I think he's getting more pitches that he likes and doing more damage to those um, in this early part of the year. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's go to a couple. We have a couple more guys I want to cover here that we've already seen in action last year in in Myrtle. The first is Christian Hernandez, dude. We got to talk about Christian because what he's doing this year is is really, really impressive. Uh, he's batting 337 with a, an on base percentage of 421. Uh, he's got a WRC plus of 153, which is incredibly high. He is, according to my bash metric, I think he has the second best in the entire organization. He is still just 20 years old. I know he's repeating Myrtle Beach, but the strikeout rate is down 22%. The walk rate is up 10, 10.5%. Across the board, the numbers he's putting up is are terrific. And really, the eye test is kind of proven like he's he's he seems more legit, right? Yeah, he looks a lot more patient at the plate. And, uh, you know, he's putting himself back on the map, which is really, really good to see after last year was uh, such a struggle for him. But, uh, yeah, I think the one thing that strikes me with Christian here in this second year is is patience because, mm-hmm. um, you know, last year he was getting down early in counts and that would kind of set him back. And then, um, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do what he wanted to with his at-bats. I think this year he's letting the pitches come to him. And, uh, you know, the ones that he likes, he's really driving. I think he's doing a lot more damage so far this year. Um, but you know, you go back to April last year and he got a really good start to the year. He batted, I think 290, 293 in that range throughout the first month, didn't strike out too often. And then the pitchers figured him out and he had a really rough stretch, um, during the summer. So with Christian, I think now you want to see that consistency kind of build as these, uh, these summer games heat up and, and go on. But, um, yeah, really, really encouraging stuff from Christian and, you know, we talked about this in the preseason episode, but to have his brother here, I think, is is proving to have some extra motivation and, uh, you know, just another level of comfort because, um, you know, Christian comes from the Dominican Republic. He played in Arizona in 2022, um, Myrtle Beach last year. But to have your brother on the same team as you has got to be a good feeling. And then, you know, our, our season opening series against Fayetteville back in early April, his parents actually got to come watch them both play. So, um you know, you can't really put a stat, you can't really put a number on that, but I think that's that's definitely proven to be a, a difference for him and his hot start so far. The the big thing I noticed mechanically with Christian is that he seems to have widened out his base a little bit, where like I think his, his feet are farther apart. But besides that, I can't really tell much of a difference besides the feet being his his stance being a little bit wider. I can't see much of a difference in terms of, of the way he's attacking the baseball. And that just goes to show that like patience does make a difference, right? The, the patient, whether you're a more patient hitter to draw walks or just a more patient hitter to, to find your pitch to drive. Because I felt, it felt like last year he was swinging a lot earlier in counts where he was just kind of dribbling pitches to shortstop, dribbling pitches to third base. And I'm seeing that, that a little bit less. I think he's driving the ball a little bit more this year, which is impressive. Uh, he's hitting the ball on the ground a little bit more than I'd like. He's hitting the ball on the ground 55% of the time. 
that'll come down. I think as he gets a little bit older, as he gets a little bit stronger, but yeah, he's been, he's been really impressed. It's worth all these, these positive things. I'll, I'll point out that, that his batting average in, on balls in play is 443 this year. So that's, that's unsustainably high. Like that's not, that's, that's, that would probably be the highest BABIP in the history of baseball if it stayed 443. Uh, so like that's going to come down. So like the, his numbers will fall because of that. But the bright side is the numbers are so good right now. Even if that number comes down, like the stats can still be good, you know? Yeah, no doubt about it. I think, you know, last year he went through some really, really rough stretches in June and July where he was just swinging at everything. And, you know, not saying that's not going to happen this year. You hope it's not going to. But so far, like he just looks, um, like I said, more patient and just not swinging at, at pitches that are way out of the zone and, uh, you know, stuff that would put him down in counts. And rather he's, you know, fouling good pitches off and, um, you know, just letting the pitches come to him a little bit more and, and working deeper in at bats to get that pitch he likes. Yeah. So Christian might be back. Uh, another guy who might be back is Reggie Preciado, who has kind of gone through it the past couple of years, dude, like between the injuries and trying to come back from injury and not really being getting in the groove of things. And he's just Preciado has just had a really rough couple of years, few years since coming over as a part of the U Darvish trade a few years back with the Padres. He was a part of the deal with with Owen Casey and Yison Santana and uh, uh, Ismail Mania. And I think Zach Davies was a part of that deal as well weirdly enough, but Preciado is still just 21 years old, which is, cra- well, he's playing his 21 year old season, which is crazy. And it seems like he's been around for a hot minute and he kind of has been around for a hot minute, but he's still just in his 21 year old season. Reggie Preciado this year is batting 308 with an on-base percentage of 382. He's got a WRC plus of 133. So 33% better than the league average. The strikeout numbers are still, I mean, he's still stri- striking out 33% of the time, but the walk rate is there, which that hasn't been in the, the case in the past. He's walking almost 11% of his at-bats, of his plate appearances. So uh, Reggie Preciado, the, the power hasn't quite come, but he's looking a whole lot more comfortable at the plate as a right-handed hitter only. Yeah, he, um, I think the big thing for him so far in this first month, he's playing free. I mean, he's just, he's healthy. And not only that, you talk about the hitting numbers, but the guy has played every single infield spot besides shortstop, third base, second base. Now he's playing at first base, which we saw for the first time against Salem. He's gotten in left field. He's made some great plays in left field. I mean, he's just showing how versatile of a player he is. While, like you said, now focusing on just the the righty swing, which he got the whole offseason to prepare for just being a righty and, uh, you know, told me a few weeks ago that that a, la- a large majority of this offseason was focusing on seeing the slider and seeing the curveball coming in um, from the right handed side because he used to spend all of his attention on the left handed side because that's not his natural side. So he tried to, you know, improve his hitting numbers from the lefty side. But um, yeah, he- he's just playing like a, a free player. Um, versatile in the field and uh, the contact has been so much better. And I really hope those power numbers really come along because, um, you know, I said this in the preseason episode, but he's just a guy that I'm really cheering for. Um, you know, really, really nice dude has, has had some setbacks the past couple of years, um, but now is ready to put himself back on the map. And we actually have a, uh, I, I think it's coming out this week or next week, but our first feature story is on Reggie Preciado nice. and he's kind of got some background as to, you know, what's what's kind of been going on the past couple of years with the leg injury and then the foot injury or the uh, the hand injury last year. And, uh, you know, what's kind of gone on to him ditching the switch hitting and now just playing righty and now playing all different positions in the field. So that'll be coming out soon. But he is uh, he is really just broken back on the scene so far this early part of the year. That's really cool. I'm looking forward to that that piece. I you mentioned the switch, the, the switch, or the the going away from switch hitting, right? Going to, to righty only, and like the what it takes to do that. And I feel like a lot of times when guys are switch hitters and they struggle from one side of the plate or the other. I know that there were conversations about Ian Happ a few years ago, where like Ian Happ's a switch hitter, but he really struggled from the right hand side of the plate. And they're like, oh, just just ditch the righty. But like it, you're right in that you can't just. I mean, you can't just ditch it. Preciado did obviously, but he has gone his entire life or his entire switch hitting life watching sliders from righty come into you as a left-handed batter. But now he's, he's watching sliders go away from him. It's an entirely different, and he's never, he's never had to experience prior to this year, a slider running away from you because you're facing the the opposite sided pitcher. So like that, that's, I hadn't even considered that part of like the pitches just look entirely different from the right side, right, right side of the plate. 
Yeah, that was what he told me was what he spent a large part of this offseason doing was was just seeing those pitches because I mean, like you said, he hasn't seen them from that side before. Um, so he's, you know, he's, he's still going through hiccups and all that, but, um, I think it was the right move for him, especially the injury he had last year, um, on a check swing from the left side and he injured one of his finger tendons. Um, so, you know, now just focusing on that right side, I think he's just played, um, he's just, he's been a lot more comfortable with the plate and it's been fun to see. Yeah, that's good. Uh, let's go to some pitchers. We'll, we'll get back to a couple hitters at the end here, but let's, let's transition to some, some pitchers here because there's a lot of new guys. Uh, there's a lot of new guys in in Myrtle Beach in the in the pitching rotation. Uh, honestly, maybe the uh, there's a couple returners, but really for the most part, you've got an entirely new rotation there. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess you got. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. I mean, I guess Marino Sancy's back. Uh, you had some innings from from Arian Rodriguez uh, last year as well. There's a few guys, but like, dude, for the most part, it's an entirely new staff. Let's talk about well, you guys. You guys called it when um, I don't know if it was you or somebody else from Northside Bound when the when the Myrtle Beach roster first came out, and you guys said, "Oh, it looks like we're going to see a lot of piggybacks here." And yeah. uh, that was not honestly in my first three years. That was not really something that uh, the Cubs did with the Pelicans. We didn't really see a lot of piggyback guys, but now it's like. You know, we, we have kind of a rotation. Like, we have a couple of guys that start every time. But, you know, sometimes they mix and match. And sometimes they'll come out of the bullpen. And it's just kind of been – it's been a lot of newness this year as far as the pitching side of things because you got a lot of guys that are inexperienced. Um, but now, you know, a month into the year, I think everyone's starting to settle in. Dude, I, I try every week to to post on, on Tuesday morning, Tuesday early afternoon and and show people just post on Twitter, post wherever and show people like what I'm projecting the rotations to look like over the course of the week. It's just it, basically I do that based on like where where the starts were coming into this week. They're what they what how they lined up last week, um, what I've kind of heard from from people and stuff like that. But for, for Myrtle Beach, it's so hard. It is, it is so difficult because it's like, are, is is Nick Dean going to be a starter this week or is he yeah. going to be a reliever, right? Nick Dean has thrown five games this year and he started two of them, but he's got, what, how many innings? Is he? he has 17 innings this year. So it, it, it's such a unique situation in Myrtle. Let's talk about Nick Dean first because last I checked, I don't know if this is up to, up to the minute, but last I checked, he had the best swing strike rate the best whiff percentage of any Cubs prospect uh, in the entire organization so far this year. And that is, that's not something I had on my bingo card coming into the year, to be completely honest with you. I was excited to see Nick Dean, but I did not predict that was going to happen. So what have you liked about Nick Dean so far in Myrtle? Well, you look at his numbers from Maryland, especially 2022, when he really had a good season for the Terrapins. And uh, yeah, that, that walk number was down. His strikeout numbers were way up. And, uh, you know, he goes into 2023 as the Big Ten preseason pitcher of the year and, um, you know, had a solid season. But uh, one thing that really stuck out to me earlier this year, I talked to him after I think it was a second outing. It was a see, yeah, it was a second outing because he struck out eight guys in back to back um, outings to start his Pelicans career. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just asked him how he's kind of adjusting to everything. And he, you know, basically said, look, at Maryland, I was a starting pitcher. That was what I did. I had a routine like that was what it was. And now it's just a matter of being ready for anything. Because like we said, like he could piggyback, he could start a game. Um, I think Sunday's game, he was one of the last pitchers to come out mm -hmm. and pitched into the eighth inning. So, you know, he's just getting ready for all these different kind of roles. But I really like his pitch placement. Um, you know, he's got a four pitch mix, four seam fastball, slider, change up and a curveball. And he's really able to get a lot of elevation on that fastball that has a lot of life. And I think that's been his, his big pitch that's missed some bats. Um and then the slider has looked really good so far as well. But another thing that sticks out for me with Nick is uh, just the weak contact that that batters are able to get off of him. I mean, they've only had I think he's only given up three extra base hits in his 17 innings so far. Um, so, you know, not really a lot of barrels. He's not serving up batting practice and uh, he's he's striking out guys at a really, really high clip and he's doing it in all different kind of roles. So um, he's proving how versatile of a pitcher he can be on the mound. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely emerged as one of the leaders of the pitching staff in this uh, first part of the year. I could run through just about any stat for Nick Dean this year, and it looks impressive. I mean, striking out 40 percent of the batters that he faces, he's only walking not quite nine percent of the batters he faces. He has a this year well, his ERA is three point seven one, but his FIP is one point four four. Hitters are hitting just one ninety off of them. I don't 
even the ground ball rate is good. He's he's got a ground ball rate of fifty percent. Like across the board, he is he is doing exactly what you want to see. Honestly, I, I I hate to say it, Sam, but I I don't think you're going to see much more of Nick Dean in Myrtle Beach. I think that there's a good chance that we see him bumped up to South Bend, especially considering that he's a, he's a college guy. Like you said, he was Big Ten preseason pitcher of the year last year. He was their Friday night guy uh, for for Maryland. Like he he's kind of seen it a little bit, so I, I can't imagine that that he'll spend too much more time uh, with you guys down at Myrtle Beach. Yeah, I, I just you know I'm curious as to you know, as to what his role is going to be um, yeah. because we've just seen him in all different kinds of situations. I mean, I, we had Mason McGuire pitch. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, but McGuire pitched two thirds of the first inning and then got taken out and Dean threw, I think the next three. Um, so he's kind of been that fireman. Um, he's worked in late game situations. So that is one thing I'm going to be paying attention to for however long we have him is what is that role that he's going to kind of take ownership of and um, where the Cubs see those long-term plans to be. How how does that work on a week to week basis on a day day to day basis? Like wh- when does a guy know that he he's starting or relieving or relieving that day or piggybacking or one inning? Like wh- when do guys know that? Do you know? Yeah, I usually get the uh, I get the rotation on Mondays. So I you know they lay out here's the six guys that are starting each game. Um, and then I, I'm pretty sure that those guys, like Kenton Egbert, right, he's been a big piggyback guy for us. I, I'm pretty sure he knows when he's going um, and, you know, what day he's going to pitch. Because, As like a bulk inning. Bulk, yeah. so like, you know that you're a starter, so you're a bulk inning guy, but you're a reliever and a bulk inning. So there's kind of like, there's kind of two two starting rotations for the week, essentially. Essentially, yeah, 100%. So I think he knows going into it. But, you know, as far as the other guys, like, uh, Kenji Perez or Shane Marshall, um, you know, they're they're just always ready and and, and available. Um, I know that, you know, when Buddy writes out the uh, the lineup card, he's got the pitchers that are hot that night and any of those yeah. guys can go in. So, um, yeah, it's like I said, I mean, it's there's been a lot of new routines this year, new things that we've seen here at single A. Um, and uh, it's you know, it's interesting. Let's let's actually talk about Kenton Egbert because uh, he, he's a he's a fun name. He throws fun. He gets fun results too. I mean, he's thrown seven, 17 and, and two thirds innings this year. He's got a strikeout rate approaching 26%. He's got an ERA at 3.06. He's been strong. He's walking too many guys, right? 16%. But that's that's kind of a, a theme with this, this uh, pitching staff as a whole. There's a lot of walks on this team. But Kenton Egbert looked pretty good so far this year. And, and like I said, he's been a fun watch every time he takes the mound. Yeah, man, it's that leg kick that goes yeah. over his head. I told him he was on my podcast last week, and I said, like, the flexibility on you is unbelievable because I don't know how you can do that 50, 60 times a night. Um, and he told me, he said, you know, you can look at pictures of me in high school, and that leg kick isn't there. So he just oh. developed it, and uh, now it's just kind of a timing thing for him, and that's how he he delivers. Um, huh. But, yeah, he, he has been, uh, he's been really solid as that piggyback guy. I think he has started a few games, but – um, you know, just the guy coming out of the bullpen that throws throws pretty hard, has some good stuff on his off speed, and uh, has been able to get out so far. And like you said, the walks, you know, have been a, a pretty big theme with the Pelicans so far, and those have been going down as the as the season has continued. But um, you know, Kenton's just been, I think, really consistent. Yeah, he's that, that's kind of great. Does uh, I wonder if he has seen videos of of Bronson Arroyo back in the day. It's not quite a Royo like. It's a different type of leg kick, but like equally as high in a different way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he's got the long hair coming out of the back of his hat, sure. too, which he told me he hasn't cut in, I think, a year and a half. So uh, Kenton, I mean, the the fun around Kenton Egbert is is great because he's got I told him, I go, dude, you have like an aura on the mound <laughs> because you got the high socks, which in college he was wearing stirrups. Okay. Oh, um, yes. The high leg kick, the long hair. It's kind of an old school kind of uh, way of pitching. So I I love watching them. Would you Would you be a, a stirrup guy if you were playing? Would you be a stirrup guy, a high sock, a low sock? Like what What would be your your method? Man, if stirrups were available, I would be a stirrups guy. Now, when I did play as a kid, um, I I did I did high socks pretty frequently, and it's actually. So Kenton told me the reason why he wears his you know high socks or his stirrups is because he doesn't like the elastic of the pants like on his ankles okay and like he just, he's like it's a sensory thing i just don't like it and i said dude me too i hated that when i was playing so i just pulled him up yeah and, uh, get him I out of the way 
Yeah, no, right. And plus you get the colors of the socks and the stirrups too. So I always like doing that. I, I'd 100% be a stirrups guy, no doubt. About oh, yeah. That. Yep. Ha, had, have to break out the stirrups. That's the, yes, that's the best look. All right, man. Let's go to – so we talked about Egbert. Let, let's talk about – you mentioned real quick Mason McGuire. I know that that uh, he's only gotten into a few games uh, this year. I think three games, right, so far? Yeah. He's gotten into three games this year. He had the, the rough outing where he didn't make it out of the first inning. But I know that Mason McGuire is a guy we have to talk about on the show because of his last name. And I think that he he, he draws a lot of attention just based on who he is. He's, he's Mark McGuire's son. He's Mason McGuire. What, what, what have you seen from Mason in his time in Myrtle? You know, he's got a good arsenal. Um, a lot of pitches he can choose from. I mean, he's got a splitter that he actually learned from Raleigh Fingers um, back in 2019 was when his dad was being introduced at the A's uh, Hall of Fame ceremony, oh, he man. got to connect with Raleigh Fingers and actually learned a splitter from him. So um, he's got some pretty unique pitches, but, you know, the, the walks, I think, has been the big problem with Mason. And I think throughout this year, it'll be it'll be exciting to watch him because you'll see him take so many leaps. Um, you know, he's, re- he's with a really good coaching staff, really good coordinators that can make him into something really good. And, uh, you know, the foundations are definitely there. He's throwing in the 90s with his fastball. So, um, you know, it's just about adding stuff to that and uh, just controlling yourself on the mound. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, he's got so much season left to improve. It's its going to be, I think it's going to be fun to watch him by the end of the year. And not only so much season this year, but I think, I mean, he's only 20, this is his age 20 season. He, he's still got plenty of frame to build out. And I think that, that he'll get a little bit more consistent with his delivery to the plate as he adds some more muscle, as he adds, adds more to his frame, he'll be more consistent, more athletic to the plates. And when he does that, then the walk numbers will start to, to creep down a little bit. Because right now he's he's walked uh, he's walked eight guys in his six innings. He struck out three. Like I said, the numbers aren't great across the board, but this is only in six innings. Six innings pitched, right? Like this is not a this is not even remotely a large sample size. Uh, just kind of getting to know know Mason McGuire and uh, uh, what we can kind of expect from him in the future. He's still got a lot of developing to do. There's a lot, I mean, all these guys we talk about today, a lot of development left, but a high school draft pick pitcher is the peak. I, I guess I guess that and a high school draft pick catcher. Those yeah. two, those two, those two profiles are like they take a while to develop. So let's not get carried away with like, oh, Mason McGuire doesn't have it, or he does have it, or whatever. Let's just watch it all play out, you know. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, um, you know, I go back to saying how this year's, you know, just been different with the pitching staff. And, uh, you know, in previous years, we had like college arms that were experienced and, you know, were pretty polished for this level, like Brody McCullough, Nick Hull, Grant Kipp got really good last year. I think about those three guys, Mm -hmm. Um, Tyler Santana from a couple of years ago. Um, You know, we just had those guys that were were just comfortable right away pitching in single A. And, uh, you know, we do have like Nick Dean, uh, Ty Johnson, those kind of guys right now that are that are pitching pretty well. We talked about Kenton, um, but it, it's been a lot of a lot of youth and guys that are um, just at different stages of their development, I think, is kind of what's causing the the difference in uh, in routine, I think, this year. Well, you mentioned him and, you know, I wasn't going to get out of this show without talking about my guy from Ball State, Ty Johnson. Chirp, chirp. Uh, he chirp, chirp, baby. Uh, he's been. I mean, I, I can make the case that that outside of Nick Dean, that Ty Johnson has been one of the best pitchers on on the staff in Myrtle Beach this year. I mean, he's put up really, really good numbers across the board. He's get thrown 15 innings. He is striking out over 30% of the batters he faces. He's walking fewer than 10% of the batters he faces. He's got a, a, a three-flat ERA. Ty Johnson has been good. He's thrown, uh, I believe, five games this year. He's thrown five games. He's another guy. He's thrown five games, made two starts. Yeah, uh, worked in piggyback. What? What about? What do you got about Ty Johnson over there? I really like, and I was watching um, some of his starts from the past, or I guess outings from the past week, and uh, I really like his arm action because it's a quick arm action, and he kind of throws it like he doesn't bring it all the way down when he throws it. It's almost like a football throw where he just kind of takes it almost straight back, and then slings it through yeah. and I, the fastball coming out of his hand has got to be just deadly as a hitter. Um, you know, that to pair with the slider as well. And he's got a good, a, a good changeup um, to go along with that. Plus he's a really tall guy. Yeah. Um, so creates a lot of extension off the mound and uh, is able to get home really quickly. So there's, when you look at Ty Johnson, there's not a lot that you don't like, um, b- you know, because of the way that he's been performing so far this year, but just the way that that fastball just zips off the hand, um, when it's coming so quickly at you is uh, is a big attribute. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I don't have written down the readings on, on his fastball velo, but if it's if it's coming in there at 94, given the shorter arm action back here and then the extension that it gets to home plate, if it's coming in really at 94, it's perceived as a whole lot faster than that, like, 90, like 97, 98, just based on the way that he's throwing the fastball. So, yeah, I, I mean, the way, the way he throws is kind of exactly what you want to see as, in terms of his arm action. Right. That's what's yeah. being taught. That method is being taught. So, yeah, I I've really liked what I've seen from Ty Johnson this year. There's there's a lot of, a lot of chaos going on in the Myrtle Beach uh, 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 pitching staff. But Ty Johnson has been pretty good for most of his outings this year. It's been terrific. Yeah, no, he, he's been fun to watch. And we actually have a lot of uh, Indiana connections. When I first met him, um, you know, I was kind of telling him where I lived when I when I lived in Indiana. We yeah. know a lot of the same places and. I'm actually going to a wedding this weekend back in Indiana. And, uh, you know, I, I was telling him where I was going and he was like, oh, I got used to live right by there. Like, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of fun. That's cool. Is, is he an Indiana kid? I know he went to college there. Is he an Indiana kid too? Yeah. So he was, uh, I think his MILB page says he was born in Rockwall, Texas. And I don't know when he moved to Indiana, but okay. he went to Lawrence North High School, oh, did he? Okay. Um, which is in Indianapolis. And yeah. uh, so he went to high school there and um, you know, we knew a few of the same high school players. He was obviously a few years behind me, but um, yeah, and then went to Ball State. But I, I think I think he was around the Noblesville area. Okay, if I can yeah. remember right, but yeah, yeah, somewhere close to there. That's cool. I love that. Uh, yeah. Let's one more one more col- former college guy. I want to get uh, hit on here as far as pitchers go because he's been essentially the closer of this team as Shane Marshall. He's got an ERA below one. I think it's a point nine ERA. Does Shane Marshall? Sorry, I'm pulling it up here. Uh, yeah, Shane Marshall has a .9 ERA. He is striking out 28% of the batters he faces. Again, walking almost 17%. But he's he's been a fun development, has Shane Marshall. Yeah, he's got a lot of fire um, to him. You know, we yeah. had a uh, we had our, our last out against Canapolis for one of the games. It was uh, Reggie Preciado threw the batter out at home, and uh, you know Marshall is he is. Uh, I mean, he's excited about the win, which you know the whole team was because we hadn't won a game in a long time, so they were you know kind of hyped up about it. But um, I love watching him pitch, and I think he is his story keeps getting better and better as his success goes on because of you know where he came from. Right, he wasn't a pitcher in college. He pitched only like an inning and two thirds at Georgia and then has surgery in 22, doesn't pitch in 23 and uh, just has not looked overly matched so far. And uh, a lot of velocity coming off the fastball and he pairs that with some good off speed too. So um, yeah, definitely a fun story for Shane and um, you know, just you you hope for uh, the consistency to continue. Do do you know the details behind how that how that came about where he was drafted or uh, drafted and signed as a as a pitcher? Because I he, he was a catcher during his time in Georgia, right? He was a backup catcher. Backup, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's he, what he's I, a bullpen yeah. guy. <laughs> bullpen he, he he did catch. I mean, he, I don't think he was the main catcher, but um, no. yeah, he. Uh, I haven't actually asked him. I haven't gotten the chance to ask him totally what how that happened. But our boy Rich Biesterfeld. Um, got the insight and uh, sent me a message back in the beginning of the season. And he said that um, what he was told was that the story was uh, there was a Cub Scout at a Georgia game and Georgia was blowing out whoever they were playing. So Shane came in to pitch in the garbage time. And it was, you know, I, like I said, he pitched like an inning and two thirds. So it was one of those times that he came in yeah. to pitch. And uh, the scout that was there watching somebody else, saw that Shane was throwing low 90s. And they were like, <laughs> he might be able to do something with this. So they take him in the 14th round, and uh, now he's doing well for the Myrtle Beach Pelicans. So, I think, again, like the story, I I would not be shocked if, you know, I said we had the Reggie Preciado feature coming out, um, I, I think, this week. But I think Shane might be on the list if he's still in Myrtle Beach because that's just a, a really fun story. Yeah, I that that's so fun. I I think maybe the thing I question most is how is he a six foot four? 200 I mean he's listed 210 I, he's got to be more than 210 right uh, how yeah. do you have a six foot four ca- backup catcher it, it seems like he was he should have been destined for the mound right not for not for catching I don't know yeah I don't know um, but uh, they were able to find his uh, his calling I guess I think that's amazing I mean you scouts find players in every which way and it's incredible I love it uh last pitcher I want to hit on here is a guy who's really been exciting both in terms of his results but also the way in which that he pitches is Juan Bayo. Uh, Juan Bayo has has so far this year 
I'll run through the stats. 17 and two-thirds. A lot of guys on the staff with seven right around 17 innings. It's kind of weird. Uh, 17 and two-thirds innings. He has a 2.04 ERA. He's striking out 32% of the batters he faces, walking 17%. But, man, uh, Juan Bello, he he kind of has something that gets me really excited. I don't know. He's a fun player to watch. He's a guy that, like, I'm – I'm paying super close attention to like to see how legit all this is and see how far I can kind of raise him up my prospect list. Man, I, I live for Juan Bayo Day. Every Saturday, it's like, all right, let's go. Let's let's strap in for this. Um, I tell you what, I was watching, so I was watching the Pelicans game on Saturday. They were on the road in Salem. I got the I got the TV on, but I think I was scrolling TikTok or something. My mind was preoccupied, which it usually is. And uh, you know, I look up at the TV and I thought the TV was frozen. Because Juan Bayo is just stuck there with his leg up for maybe three, four seconds. And I'm like, what is going on? And then he throws the pitch and he was doing the, the delayed timing, which is something at the single A level I have not seen really all that much at all. Yeah. Um, especially for a 20 year old guy, he was in his fifth Pelican start to, to mix stuff in like that is like super advanced. And then he started to mix it up where he's like kind of moving the foot around and, and all that. And I just was like, this is, this is so cool. Um, but Juan's got one of the best fastballs, I think on the team right now. And uh, you know, last year in the complex league didn't pitch much at all. I think he was dealing with an injury, but when he did pitch, the numbers weren't great. So he was just a guy that I kind of looked over and I was like, oh, you know, I guess we'll see what we have. But um, if the results keep coming, we're looking at a, a top 30 guy by the end of the year. Um, just with the way that, that Juan's been pitching. So I, I love it, man. He he has been uh, the leader of this pitching staff so far and the most consistent starter, which is something that this team, I think, in this part of the year is really needed. Hitters are just hitting 133 off of him, which is super, super low, obviously. You, you mentioned like that he, you don't really see players at the low A level doing the little messing with timing and stuff like that. Especially, I mean, Juan Bayo is in his age twenty season <laughs> this year. So, like, like how is he? How is he that confident to be able to do that out on the mound? It's crazy. Uh, Luis Devers is a guy who has done that in the past. He's kind of drifted away from doing that, not nearly as often as he used to. He did it a little bit in Myrtle. He did a little bit in South Bend early on in his his time in the system. But it wasn't like this though. Like it was it was messing with timing. But he would still like have his knee up. Right. He'd mm -hmm. have he'd have a a traditional way of, uh, of throwing where you, you bring your knee up and you just kind of hold that there and then explode to the plate versus Bayo. It kind of has his leg out. He has his knee up. He has his leg out towards the plate. He has it back. Like it is, it's kind of all over the, he's just kind of like leaning and twisting and it it's, it is, it's unique. And I, you're right. I haven't seen that. I don't think with anyone in the system during my time covering, covering the organization. So like that's, I don't know. It, it, he's it, like I said with Ken Egbert, where he's just kind of a fun watch. Juan Bayo, in addition to being really good, is also a fun watch. Yeah, when I see George Thanopoulos, our pitching coach, um, tomorrow, that's the first question I'm asking him: is how, wh where did he learn that? Like, where did that come from? Because yeah. I love it, and uh, yeah. I mean it. Like the, the 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 clip that I posted on Twitter on Saturday was a strikeout, so obviously it's effective. Um, and yeah, man, I I just uh, I hope Juan can you know continue the progress throughout the year, because, um, you know, like I said, like he didn't really show anything last year at the complex league and now has, um, you know, really just kind of turned some heads so far in the first part of the year. All right, dude, I've got uh, two hitters that I want to, I want to cover here. The first is Christopher Passiola because Passiola has really been pretty solid this year. He, he, uh, the thing that stands out the most, I think to me is that he is tied for the organization lead the, the Cubs system lead in doubles. He's got eight doubles this year, which is tied with, I just tweeted this out the other day. He's tied with somebody um, in the organization, but that's crazy to have a guy in Myrtle beach um, to, to have that many doubles. He's been really strong this year. Overall, the, the numbers he's batting 235, which is not, not the best. He's got an OBP below 300, but he's got a 95 WRC plus, which is approaching league average. He's still in his age 20 season. He's coming off of season last year in the complex league where he was generally the same in terms of the, the production. You look at Chris Passiola, at least I do. I look at Chris Passiola and I'm like, I can kind of see something in the future, even though he's not like killing the baseball, I can kind of see something in the future. We talked about with, 
with a few of these guys, like if they just like like Mason McGuire, if he starts to put on some more muscle, some more weight, he can really be something. Christopher Passiola has he has plenty of room to, but he's still a skinny dude. He has plenty of room to put on some muscle and some weight. I could see, I can kind of squint and see something that could be really strong from Chris Passiola in the future. Yeah, he's got that gap to gap power. Um, you mentioned the doubles. He also has a home run um, on the year as well. But uh, yeah, I think. Um, I said this on a podcast not too long ago, but I think the hope for Passiola is to kind of have a a Triantos type season back in 2022 when he was with the Pelicans, because it's clear, you know, with the amount of movement that's been going on in our infield with the Hernandez brothers and Preciado kind of going everywhere, Passiola has been that everyday third baseman, which is is exactly what Triantos was a couple of years ago. And uh, James ended up playing over 100 games and hit around 270 and kind of set himself up to have that breakout season last year. So with Passiola at the age 20 season um, to, to turn over results like that, I think would be fantastic, but um, yeah, just really quiet hands. I really like the, the smooth stroke of his swing and uh, you know, the way that he kind of approaches each at bat strikeout numbers aren't too high. And that was something he was really good at last year in the complex league was um, just the plate discipline. So he's always had that attribute to his features. Um, But yeah, I mean, he's a really, really good kid. He's just, he's a chill guy. He's got that California vibe to him um, and just, you know, doesn't get too flustered at the plate, um, just really dialed in. And, uh, you know, you you hope that he can kind of put together a season like Trianto said a couple of years ago. Yeah, Passiola, you you look at like the five traditional tools, like the the five scouting tools. None of those five tools like really stand out with Passiola. I'm not saying like, oh, like he has an elite hit tool or like he's got light tower power. Like there's nothing there across the board that makes you say like, wow. But I think across the board with all five tools, you're like, "Mm, all right, like there's, there's something here. Like it's not none of them are plus right now. But if one of them becomes plus at some points and the rest of them stay really solid, then you're working with something, you know? So like this is Passiola is just like, if, if you're, if you're assembling a prospect list like that, that that's like a long play, right? That you're, you're not expecting to, to read the, the benefits of putting Passiola in your top 20 next year. You're, you're kind of hoping for the long play and, and hoping that that Passiola kind of forms into something really good as he continues to climb the ladder very, like very methodically. I, I expect to see Passiola probably spending the entire year in Myrtle beach. And like, that's perfectly fine. Makes it fun for you. No, no, it does. Seriously. And he's, uh, you know, he's good at, he's good at doing a lot of things. And I think, um, you know, what this year could be is what, what's, what's he going to find out those things that he's great at, you know, and what, yeah. who is he going to be as a player? Um, and I think that that's, that's a lot of, uh, that's something that a lot of players find out in Myrtle Beach. So um, yeah, I, I would love to see Passiola just have a lot of success here. Can we talk Alfonso and Rosario? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. I mean, so he he came in his first it was his first game uh playing for the Myrtle Beach Pelicans went yard in that game I believe right and then it was 2 days later I should have, I should have had this pulled up but it was 2 days later I think he went yard again across across I mean he he was a late arrival to Myrtle Beach right so he doesn't have the same amount of plate appearances as, as the rest of the bunch across the board the numbers aren't great at this point I mean he's batting 200 he's got an OPS of 620 WRC plus of 78. And like, more importantly, he's, he's striking out 46% of his at-bats and walking only 2%. That's only in 41 plate appearances though. But really like the athleticism seems to come across pretty well as soon as you watch him do anything. Yeah. It was his, uh, it was his second and third game or third and fourth game, I think in Salem. Cause I think he went hitless his first two games. Yeah. So his third and fourth game in Salem hits a home run. And then his fifth and sixth game has a double in those, those, those next two games. Yeah. So um, what I, and I haven't even seen the guy in person yet because he got to the Pelicans in Lynchburg. We just came, we're coming off a two week road trip. So I haven't seen yeah. these guys in ages, it seems like. Um, but so when he gets here, I mean, I just seeing him on the TV, it's like, he's got a major league build. Like you can tell yeah. the legs are powerful, strong upper body, tall guy, um, just kind of like an outfield dream almost. And, uh, the power he's able to generate on that swing in, you know, the very small amount that we've seen him is legit. So I actually have a friend um, that scouted him and uh, she works for the Cubs. Her name's Melindis. And uh, she was able to scout him when he was in Lexington, South Carolina. And he came to a showcase in Myrtle Beach, actually, last year, last summer, there was a uh, a showcase for potential draft picks. And uh, Rosario was one of the guys. And the Cubs really liked what they saw. Um, and how could you not when you look at the guy just physically? 
Um, a lot, a lot of tools there. And yeah, just uh, from what I've heard, a really good kid, uh, really determined and just has so many skills that you can build upon and, and turn into a really good baseball player. Rosario was drafted in the sixth round last year. He's six foot six. Um, he's a big, real big dude already. There, there's everything I heard from him down in down in Mesa when he was working down in extended spring, spring training or just regular spring training down this year. Everything I heard was just that he was he was showing out. He just looked different than the other guys that he was playing with. I know the exit velo numbers are pretty impressive. I I, I know that for a fact. For a guy who's what this is age age nineteen age twenty season I guess it's technically his age twenty season, but for him to be putting up exit velo numbers that are that are crazy this young is awesome. I, I I think that I'm not expecting like this great slash line from him over the course of the season. I just want to show like see that the pure talent that he has. Right, I want to see some absolute tanks. I want to see him go run down some balls in center field. I want to see him show off the arm in right field if he's playing there. Like I, I want to see some of those like the we talked about with, with Passiola where like the tools aren't really like plus on uh, across the board, but like maybe one of them gets there. Alfonso Rosario, like the there those those like tools are there, right? You see the strong arm, you see the light tower power, you see the the ability to run down balls in the outfield. It's like it's kind of honing all of that. And that's yeah. going to take some time. I don't know. I, I I'm just excited to watch more of Alfonso and Rosario this year. Let's just let's get a sick highlight reel this year. Let me get some really good home run calls. Let's get some diving catches in the outfield. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the numbers say. If we got a cool highlight tape, that's all we need. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, you get to show it off later down the road when he's hitting hitting bombs in the major leagues, and you can say, oh, look, look at this call I had of his bomb to left field. So hey, that's or, what or I did with PCA a couple uh, well, about a week and a half ago. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's uh, that's all I had in terms of players that I wanted to specifically talk about. It, who am I missing, man? Like, is there anybody that you wanted to specifically call out that you've you've enjoyed watching during the short amount of time in Myrtle this year? Well, I mean, I, I tweeted this out last week, but um, just a, a different year because uh, the amount of turnover that we're already having. I think by this time last year, we had five roster moves. Uh, so far this year, we've had 25. So New players up and down. I think it's really interesting with the way that the complex league, uh, the season now is earlier in the year. So if you have a guy struggling in Myrtle Beach, like, you know, we had Carter Trice and Drew Bowser that were, um, you know, struggling in their first taste of full season baseball. You could send them right down and get them right in game action and figure some things out back in Arizona and, uh, you know, just kind of get right there before you get to Myrtle Beach, uh, get back to Myrtle Beach, which we saw with Pedro Ramirez and how, much improved he was last year after going down for a few weeks. So there's been a, a lot of guys so far that have kind of been up and down. Um, I will say, I uh, I would have thought you were crazy if, if, if you knew I was saying this on the podcast at this point in the year. But uh, Kenji Perez, who last year was wild, to begin things this year was wild, has looked a lot more refined his last few outings. I think it's been his last four outings, has not allowed a single run. And uh, has really, you know, been more in the zone because he's living more on his breaking balls. His breaking balls get in the zone a lot more than his fastball does. And, uh, you know, that, that's that been one thing that I'm going to keep my eye on with Kenji is because, you know, he's been at, he's been at a point where there really was no place to go but up. Yeah. Um, but now I think we're seeing some some leaps and bounds in that development. And, uh, you know, Perez has looked a lot better. So I want to watch him throughout the year and see if he can sustain it. I mean, the stuff's good. Like the cut, yeah. the stuff from from Kenji Perez is terrific. I I think it was game one this year that he came in in relief, and I think it was yeah, I think it was game one, and he was just all over the place, dude. Like he he was all over the place, and I was like, oh my gosh. And and I mean that that's what happens down at the level. I mean that's what happens down in low A, where you have guys that have good. St- you, you have both ends of the spectrum, where you have guys that have really good stuff that just can't seem to find. It's like let's harness this a little bit and figure it out you also have guys like they need to improve their stuff like they're hanging around the zone they're college guys that that are that have been assigned to myrtle beach out the gate and they they hover around the zone a lot but we just need to see a new slider incorporated and get a better feel for that or a fastball that has a little a slightly different grip and like see how that plays a little bit a little bit better so i mean not every day you get a Cade Horton coming to Myrtle Beach and, and being able to just run run through guys. Well, and we've had some great pitching coaches um, in my time. Clayton Mortensen for the first two years, uh, Bruce Billings last year, and then Armando Gabino and George Thanopoulos with us this year that 
uh, are no doubt going to get these guys right. And uh, you can see that happening now where, um, you know, our eighth or ninth game of the year, we walked 17 guys and it was a four hour game and it's, you know, it wasn't great. And, you know, from that game on, I think things have gotten a lot better and the guys have settled in and are locating a lot better. They're missing bats. And uh, it's just, you know, all together, you can see the, uh, you can see the improvement, which is what this, this level is all about. What are you, uh, what are you looking forward to most throughout the rest of the season with this team? Is it just the the growth of, of, of the players as a whole? Yeah, I think you can compare this team um, a lot with the 2021 team where it was, uh, you know, we had some guys start off really slow, like Jordan Wogu in the first half was was a really slow start. And then, you know, something clicked for him in July and August and he was able to put it together and Matt Mervis was able to put it together. And um, yeah, I think with this year's team, it's just going to be like, all right, let's let's take a look at where you started at and where you finished at and see how much better it is, because I think there's a lot of players that um, – you know, are just going to are going to look a lot better. Like Drew Bowser went down to the complex league last week after a really slow start. But I have no doubt with what he was able to do at Stanford, uh, he's going to come back and, and definitely get things right and be a, more, a much more consistent hitter. Carter Trice as well. Um, you know, he went down to Arizona, but when he comes back, uh, you know, what kind of player is he going to be? Um, what is because, you know, he's obviously doing the catcher conversion thing. How is he going to pr- improve in that area? So. I don't know, man. There's 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 so many storylines. And um, you know, I go back to last year. Last year's team also had a slow start. I think they were 17 and 19 by May 20th. And then they went on to win 20 of 26 games and win the first half. So, you know, this team has a losing record right now, but you never know what the month of May is gonna hold or you know what the second half is gonna be like, too. So uh, yeah, there, there's just uh, there's a lot of fun things to look forward to as the season goes on. So we'll take a, a, a snapshot of the organ or of the team right now uh, yeah. with you with you on. We'll have you on towards the end of the season. We'll take a snapshot there, see how how things have progressed, how things have changed uh, with the Pelicans over the course of the season. It'll be great. So, um, all right, man, I appreciate you coming on. Can't thank you enough. As always, uh, you're the best. Uh, plug yourself. Well, I know that you you mentioned there's the there's the uh, Reggie Preciado content coming soon for from the pelicans i know you're doing stuff for coastal baseball as well you have any more any more calls from the left field uh concourse for coastal carolina coming up either man that was a that was a one-time thing and it was the most incredible experience man it was uh it it had been in the talks for a few months and uh, to be able to put a show like that together uh just to broadcast a game from the outfield is not something any you know everybody gets to do so uh, yeah, getting that together, doing like a, we did like a college game day show yeah. beforehand for like 15 minutes and got to go out to the tailgates and, um, you know, coastal Carolina is crazy about their baseball. So, uh, getting able you know, being able to do that was, was awesome. But, um, yeah, all the, all the fun feature stuff is going to be on the, uh, the Twitter is at Pelican baseball. The Instagram is Pelicans baseball, um, Facebook, YouTube, Myrtle beach Pelicans. Um, we'll have some really good content coming out. And then, my Twitter is uh, Sam underscore Weederhaft and Instagram at Weederhaft. Um, but yeah, just uh, another fun summer of content coming. And Greg, dude, thanks for having me on as always. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. Um, you guys can follow us on, on follow the show on anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Check us out on the YouTube page. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to give us a like. I'll leave a comment down below on who your favorite uh, Myrtle Beach Pelican is so far this season. That would be great. Subscribe if you could. We really appreciate you guys interacting on the YouTube channel. In addition to that, you can find us over on Instagram. I've been posting some graphics over there and some content over on uh, Cubs on Deck on Instagram. The Cubs on Deck pod on Twitter. You can find me at Out of the Vines on Twitter. All of that good stuff. We can't honestly. I've, I've had I've had a few of you guys reach out to me uh, in DMs on Twitter recently, just kind of giving a shout out to 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 the show and stuff like that. And I, I cannot thank you guys enough for for always tuning in. We guys we have we have a, a pretty incredibly loyal fan base in terms of you guys out there listening, and it it really goes to show the the loyal fan base that is Cubs minor league baseball because I think that that Cubs minor league fans are unreal and it doesn't happen in every organization. That's for sure. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and uh, we'll be back in your ears, me and Brian, I believe next week in one short week. Thanks guys.